Welcome back out on the mushroom trail. It is another just beautiful spring day here in the forest of the Pacific Northwest. We've got a little bit of a different game plan for you today. So we're gonna start out here in my local lowland forest here in Western Washington. But then a little later today, I'm gonna be taking you out to a burn site west of the Cascade Mountains. So this is, you know, west of the ridge, but still at low elevation, just at the foot of the mountains. We're gonna check out a burn site from last year, 2023. I'm curious to check in on the status of the burn morels. So this is kind of that interesting time in April where a lot of stuff is starting to pop out, including burn morels. So it can be tough to keep tabs on what's happening when. So I was hoping that I could kind of throw together a little bit of an update and uh, let you all know what I'm seeing out there and hopefully it helps you all find some great mushrooms out there. So if you're liking these videos, remember, hit the like button, subscribe, stay tuned. Let's jump into this forest. Let's see what we see. So moving just down the trail here, we've got you know, some dug fir, lots of slough. We've got a cedar here. And if we look at the base of this cedar tree, we're gonna see something really interesting. So we've actually got a couple different mushroom species going right next to each other. So we see over here on the right, these are in the Inosibi genus. These are those white fiber caps that we've discussed in the past. If we pan over and we take a look over here to the left, we see an especially photogenic mushroom this is what's known as the panther cap, Amanita pantheroides. Now this is a member of the Amanita pantherina complex. So if you're overseas in UK or Europe, you've got the Amanita pantherina. This is essentially the Pacific Northwest version of that same mushroom. And we notice on this cap, this kind of classic kind of white warts or spotting on the cap. So these are remnants of the universal veil. So the Amanita mushrooms, as many of you probably know, are born in what's referred to as a universal veil or a cup. So if I peel this back and we look underneath, we can see this real distinct cup structure. This is really, really important when you're kind of IDing specific types of mushrooms because you really want to get good at weeding out or kind of pinpointing which ones are in the Amanita genus because there are a lot of very, very toxic mushrooms in this genus. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this up so that we can get a closer look. So notice that this has this tight cup-like structure. So in an even younger stage, this entire mushroom was contained in that universal veil. We can see that it's broken through that and these white spots that are on the cap are actually the remnants of that universal veil. So notice also if we look underneath this at this young stage, we see a partial veil that's actually covering the gill structure there. So as this mushroom matures, it's going to actually expose the gills underneath. And when it does that, it's going to leave a, a skirt or an annulus on that stem or stipe. So that's something that's very characteristic of these Amanita mushrooms, specifically the panther cap. And, you know, it goes without saying that this has a light brown cap. We can see a little darker at the center. Obviously, right now it's very rounded um, and kind of bell or ball shaped. But as this matures and gets bigger, it'll get almost flat on the surface. So you may recall in last week's video, we had a more mature one that had kind of expanded outward. There was a distinct skirt and the gills were exposed and the cap had become flat on top for the most part. So this is in its very early stages, so it's still getting there. Now it's also worth noting, so when we look down underneath, you might be able to see like a real distinctive kind of bowl in the ground here. So this particular mushroom, a lot of times people have sought this out for recreational purposes because maybe they know that it's related to the Alice in Wonderland mushroom, the fly agaric, Amanita muscaria. But, you know, it's worth noting that this particular one is responsible for a lot of poisonings out here in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, in fact, I think it's the most frequently cited mushroom in uh, 
kind of problematic cases, not just involving humans, but even dogs and cats. So this contains a lot of ibotenic acid and muscimol. Um, a lot of times this one is actually oftentimes responsible for bringing about kind of a coma in people. So it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, the fact that it induces or can tend to induce comas in folks is suggestive of the fact that perhaps this one is very high in muscimol because it it brings about that state more frequently than um, the fly agaric. So kind of interesting. And if we pan back over here to this fiber cap, so this one, um, you'll notice as I referenced before, this is in Ninosibi genus. Here's one thing though that I wanna point out that's kind of interesting. So we've talked about this at length uh, in the past. This is also another toxic mushroom that's best avoided. It's very uh, complex genus with lots of different species. We've looked at Inosibi lilacina. We've looked at the Geophyla group, which this is likely a member of. But look over here to the right of this. So here's what's kind of fascinating is that if you've got a really sharp eye, you may recognize that this is actually the cup that an Amanita grew out of. So, you know, very likely some form of wildlife that hopefully is not uh, subject to the toxicity of an Amanita, actually got in there and uh, kind of swiped that, what I suspect was a panther cap, right out of that cup that was growing next to those fiber caps. And similarly, if we look around the base of this um, western red cedar here, we see another kind of stipe that's missing the uh, mushroom. If I dig down and we take a look at this, so here's what I wanna show you. This is kind of cool, cause you can tell from the presence of that vulva or that cup, that this was also an Amanita mushroom. So obviously it's been kind of harvested by some form of wildlife, but there we go. And this is, you know, a lot of times people will be hunting different mushrooms that may on the surface look kind of similar, especially in their younger state to an Amanita. So you really wanna get good at being able to recognize this vulva or cup and really kind of, uh, if you're ever harvesting a mushroom that looks similar or can look similar to Amanitas, like say the Prince, you really wanna rule out the possibility of it being an Amanita, because as discussed, there's lots of um, possible consequences of getting those confused. So it's a really good one to be able to identify. Really cool to see out here. And you know, this time of year in the spring in the Pacific Northwest, this is one that's really, really out. And every time that I see it, I really enjoy being able to stop and pause and appreciate the beauty of this one because it really is a stunner and it's really out right now. So if you're here in the Pacific Northwest, keep your eyes peeled. Very good looking mushroom out here in the panther cap, Amanita panthernoides. Moving just down the trail here, we've got an interesting little mushroom that's quite common. Check this out. So notice, this mushroom is growing from what looks to be horse manure. And notice we've got this long, slender stipe. We've also got this frilly little margin, right, at these edges. This is what's commonly referred to as the petticoat model gill. And this has gone by a lot of different scientific or Latin names. I believe that it's currently in the Peniolus genus. Um, but I'll, I'll throw that name, the full Latin name, up on the screen there. But again, this is the petticoat model gill. Oftentimes it'll grow from dung of different sorts. So this is growing from what looks to be horse manure, just off on the side of the trail here. And we see this real distinct kind of slender stipe. You can see this one's been pulled up by an animal or human. We've got really dark gills underneath perhaps darkened by the spores themselves. And again, that ruffled or frilled margin. So that's Paniolus papilinaceus, the petticoat model gill out here. Really fun to see. So moving just off the trail here and in and amongst the Douglas firs, as well as a little hazelnut clump here off to the side. See beautiful orangish colored mushroom. If I zoom in on that, let's take a quick look here and see. So we see that we've got kind of that brownish orange cap. Oops, 
This one broke on me a little bit, but we see sort of really flared out gill structure here. Very unique, right? And you can see how the margin of this more mature specimen here is really kind of curled up and we've got these decently spaced gills here that are staring at us that are kind of like a salmon-ish color, right? You could say like pink or orangish brown color gill here. So very interesting to see. And if we look over here to the side, we'll notice some less mature specimens here. So you can see those striations on the cap. Little wavy at the margin there, a little darker in the center. I believe that what we're looking at here is what's commonly referred to as the deceiver in the Lacaria genus. Now there are quite a few mushrooms within this Lacaria genus that can be somewhat difficult to differentiate, but I believe that what we're looking at here, the deceiver would be classed as Lacaria lacata. There are a couple others that are really similar, so it's not 100% certainty, but that's what I would pin this one as just on this initial assessment. So very interesting to see, nice, beautiful, widely spaced gills. I love too how those kind of curl up on that mature mushroom. It's just a joy to look at out here off the side of the trail. Cool to see, deceiver. And just over here next to the deceiver, Lacaria lacata, as I look just down the trail off to the side, another mushroom caught my eye over here. And this is one that we spoke of or referenced recently. So let's zoom in, let's take a look. This is an edible mushroom, but definitely not a choice edible mushroom. So we talked about this, this is the deer mushroom, right? So this is um, Pluteus cervinus is the scientific name. This is as referenced in past videos. This was frequently referred to as one of the war mushrooms following World War II or during World War II in Germany when food was a little scarce. This was one of those food sources that could be found in abundance when tastier or more nutritional mushrooms weren't available. So it's worth noting that this one, so if we look at it, it's got this slightly kind of hairy or furry cap. It's a pretty good sized mushroom, which is one of the reasons why it was sought out in times of need. If I look underneath this cap, what we're gonna notice, yeah, see that pinkish kind of spore print? We also notice free gills. So those gills, let me set this down so that we can get a really good look at it. Notice that those gills are completely separate from the stipe or stem. Now we'll oftentimes see a lot of springtails jumping around in here, especially when you go to cook them. Right now I see some mites. I don't see springtails necessarily on this particular one, but I would, I would bet a lot of money that those are in there and that if we took this to the, uh, actual pan, they'd kind of find their way out and uh, into our meal as well. So kind of an interesting mushroom to see out here. And uh, this one, you know, again, not typically sought after. This isn't one that I look to harvest as an edible. I would eat it if I were really uh, kind of desperate or something, because it is quite meaty, you know, there's a lot there but it's not uh, a flavor that people tend to prefer. It oftentimes is compared to radishes. So it's kind of got, you might detect that scent if you smell this, it'll smell a little bit like radishes and it'll have that kind of particular radish aftertaste. So if you're into that, you might really like these, but not recommended by myself and uh, most others that I know who are out there looking for choice edible mushrooms. This has never made anyone's list that I've known. So you may be the first though, if you love this one or you've got a particular fondness for it, let me know. But cool to know that historically in Europe, this was referred to as a war mushroom along with several other species. So very cool to see out here and definitely a good one to know. So this is again, the deer mushroom, Pluteus cervinus. So check this out, just up from this, you know, this is the deer mushroom that we were just looking at. If I zoom up and I look over here, we've got a little clump of, this is like a hazelnut tree that has a little bit of a shrubby growth. Look what was just above my head as I was describing these other mushrooms. Lo and behold, our old friend here, the panther cap. 
So, you know, we referenced just a second ago, we looked at how some of these panther caps have been harvested by some form of wildlife, likely a squirrel or some other little critter or creature. Sometimes what these animals will do is they'll take these mushrooms up to, you know, like little high points or branches, and they'll actually dry them out and sometimes store them for a snack some, some point later in the season or later in the year. So I don't know for sure. I mean, I suppose it's possible that another human uh, put this up here for some reason. But if I had to bet, I would guess that this was the doing uh, or work of some animal, some wildlife has kind of placed this up there. And you can see it's been nibbled on quite a bit. So something's been eaten away at this. So just very interesting to see. Um, definitely not one that's recommended for dogs, cats, or humans, but there's some animals out here that really get some value out of this one. So, so super interesting to see. So I'm just a little ways off trail here and I'm underneath some dug firs as well as a yew tree, which this is a little less common than some of the other tree species out here. But I see an interesting spring edible mushroom underneath here. Now, it's worth noting this is not one of the spring edibles that I necessarily get super excited about. This is what's known as the spring field cap. This is in the genus Agrosibi. And this, is, this particular one, I believe, is Agrosibi praecox. So what I want to point out, notice how this one's a little older. So the cap has started to curl up a little bit. We notice that it's kind of a light brown. It's got a few little scaly marks on there. Um, but if we turn this over and we look at the stipe, we notice this skirt or annulus. This is from a partial veil that covered the gills at a younger age. On top of that, we can see close gills, a light brown spore color, right? So we can see how those gills have been colored by the spores underneath and um, a fairly robust stipe. So this one, you know, a little old, probably not one that I would consider taking home to the dinner table. But if we look over here, we see a younger one. So this one is, is probably a pretty good age for eating. Not that I'm gonna necessarily bring this one home like I referenced, it's not generally at the top of my list. If we peel this back and we look here, Notice this, so this is really interesting. This is something that's kind of, um, I see fairly often with agrosibi. See those real strong mycelial fibers coming off of the base of that? That's something that I tend to observe with these. If we turn this over and we take a look, yeah, notice how underneath we've got a complete partial veil, right? So that's still intact. As this thing grows and matures and the cap spreads out, that partial veil will break away and that's what will leave that annulus or that ring around the stipe that we observed on that other one. So really interesting to see. I'm going to leave this one here. I'm not necessarily going to harvest it. As I look around, I do see some others too. Let's take a quick peek at this one up here. So you can see this one's even further along. And if we look at this, you can see this is way past any time that you'd really want to consider eating it. But again, we see that cap kind of curled up at the edges. We see an even darker spore print on those gills, right? And we also see again that kind of somewhat fibrous, sturdy stipe. Um, and we can see that kind of curling there at the base. We might even observe some of those mycelial fibers coming off of that. But really interesting to see. So again, this is the spring field cap, an edible mushroom, not one that I typically am on the prowl for. I'm not really too interested in harvesting this today, but it's good to know, especially if you're in a situation where you needed to find some edible food out here. This would be one that would be on my list of just ones to get good at identifying. Now, it's worth noting too that there are several different mushrooms in this agrosibi genus. And um, so, you know, I'm calling this one agrosibi praecox, but it is possible too. There are other similar species that can be tough to differentiate, but in general, we refer to these as the field caps. So cool to see. And I've just been following these game trails through the forest. I always take you some interesting places. Got a lot of bird songs, some frogs going wild, lots of 
big cedar trees out here. And I saw one thing that kind of jumped out at me. We've got a downed maple over here. And if we look at the base of this downed maple, check this out. So we've got a lot of interesting stuff going on here. So check this out. So we've got some mica caps there. These are one that we've featured again in previous videos. That's the bulk of these are those mica caps. So this is Capernellus micaceus. This is an edible mushroom. Again, this one has a common kind of relative called the alcohol inky cap. It can give people a tough time if they drink alcohol within too close of a time of consuming them. This is not that species. This is the mica cap. But at the same time, a lot of people avoid inky caps in general because of those observed behaviors that are kind of catch people off guard or surprise people. On these mica caps, what you might notice is that, let me see if we can actually observe this. So on some of these old, or some of the younger ones, I'm sorry, you'll see these little mica-like flecks on the actual caps. Let's see over here. And that tends to be how it actually gets its common name. I'm not seeing it as a prime example on any of these necessarily, but you know, as referenced in prior videos, as these age and mature, so these gills are really, really unique. So you can see very dark in color. If we compare this to a younger one, let me pluck one of these younger ones and we'll put this right next to it. So they actually are gonna start out white and solid and somewhat firm. But within a very short amount of time, they're gonna actually turn black and then they're gonna go through and they're gonna actually go through a process of liquefaction which there's a fancy term for that, but basically, you know, like these gills are gonna turn into this massive kind of gooey black ink-like substance, which is how these ones get their common name as a group as being the inky caps. So, and that happens within a very short amount of time. So a lot of times if someone is looking to kind of harvest these as an edible, time is certainly of the essence because you really want it in this very young stage you know you don't want it to be too far too far along in that process because that's certainly not going to make for an enjoyable eating experience um, now it's interesting so up here we've got a different mushroom fruiting off of this uh, maple and again this has been out here a while it's kind of curled up i'm sure several of you recognize this this is actually an oyster mushroom, Pleurotus genus, growing off of the base of this maple. So very interesting to see. Oyster, of course, is a great edible mushroom that I'm sure several of you have tried. They tend to be a little buggy out here, especially if they've been out for a while. Um, this one too, I can just tell by the way that it's kind of furling up. Um, I'm not too interested in uh, taking that one home, but it is cool to see and it's one of those things that causes me to kind of investigate a little closer. Maybe I'll scour the rest of this log and just kind of see if I can find any fresher oysters out here. But again, those oyster mushrooms, pretty unique. I know I mentioned this in recent videos, but in case you missed those, I'll mention it one more time. One thing that's really unique about these oyster mushrooms is that not only are they, you know, great edible, but they're also very high in protein lots of trace minerals and different things. Additionally, one thing that people are surprised to learn is that these mushrooms in the Pleurotus genus, the oysters, are actually carnivorous. So they've actually figured out a strategy where they will intentionally attract nematodes, which are small kind of microscopic little worm-like beings, and they'll actually consume those nematodes. So they're one of those carnivorous fungi. There are several different types that are carnivorous, this being one of them. So that really serves this well, especially when it's uh, you know growing in an environment that might be nitrogen depleted. It's an excellent way for them to source nitrogen and to really be successful out here in nature. So always cool to see the oyster mushroom. Keep your eyes peeled for that, a great edible. And uh, the inky cap as well. The I guess I should say mica cap to be more specific, one of the inky caps. So really cool to see out here. Keep your eyes peeled. Always fun to see what spring mushrooms are popping out 
in the forest. So we just hopped over on the other side of this log and lo and behold, we've got a lot more of these mica caps doing their thing. So I just figured I'd give you a quick view. Also wanted to show you this one much further along. Sometimes when you encounter these, they may be much further along in that phase, so they may have really changed the way they look. And you can see a good example of that right there. These other ones, of course, much, much younger. But uh, awesome to see out here, the mica cap. Very cool mushroom. Super interesting and really out right now. So keep your eyes peeled. Moving just down the trail here, see a little slight splash of color just off to the side of the trail here. Check this out. So we've got an ascomycete, a little cup fungus. This is the spring orange peel fungus, Calascypha fulgens. So we referenced this one last week. You can kind of differentiate this from uh, its edible counterpart referred to as the orange peel fungus. That's an edible mushroom that can look similar, but this one is different. This is inedible, reportedly toxic. And if we look at this, we see that this has like kind of a blue green edge on the outside. It's got a very similar structure overall to the orange peel fungus, but this, the spring orange peel fungus, not one that we wanna bring home to the table. So interesting to see out here and you know as i referenced last week when i featured this one in greater detail it really blends in even though it's a bright color it's easy to miss but the interesting thing about that and i suppose about all mushrooms is that really once we get a search image ingrained in our minds we start to see things everywhere and you know that goes for just about anything right like you'll find in life that once you start to recognize one specific kind of image or thing, you start to notice that it's everywhere. And that's true for a lot of mushrooms too. You hear that a lot of times for uh, morels in particular, is that people will look and look and search and search for morels. And there's a famous story from David Aurora um, where he references that idea that, you know, there was someone who just could not find morels. They were looking and looking and looking repeatedly and had no luck and then suddenly one day this person found their first morel and they looked around to discover that they were totally surrounded by morels and that they were everywhere but they were just hard to see right because they blended in well so a lot of these mushrooms it takes some experience and really you know the more time that we spend with mushrooms it's like any relationship right Relationships involve time, right? And the more that you spend time with these different species, the more you get to know them and the more that you recognize them and can find them or spot them in the wild. So all of this is a bit of a process, but boy, such a fun journey. And you're gonna find that the more time you spend outside in general, the more you're gonna get to know all these different mushrooms. And boy, I just love that process of really kind of continuing to learn and to grow and to get to know our environment and the things in it that much better. So always a pleasure being out here and uh, we'll see what else we see out here. Let's venture in a little deeper, see what else jumps out at us. Just up here on the side of the trail, got a beautiful display of a mushroom that we featured here several times. This is the Alpine jelly cone. Guapiniopsis alpina. And boy, you can just see beautiful mushroom to look at. We've got that gumdrop shape hanging off of these sticks and twigs. This is commonly referred to as the poor man's gumdrop because this is one of the very few mushrooms out here in the forest. You can actually eat raw right off the stick. Now I'll add too that this is, these are kind of flared out. I can tell just from having seen and, you know, consumed plenty of these. Um, I can tell they've been out here quite a while. So this isn't necessarily something that I'll partake in today, but very cool mushroom that I always love to see. This is one of my favorite early spring sites. They kind of fired up a little bit earlier than usual this year. So I've been seeing quite a few of these. So we might actually be getting towards the tail end of these here in the Pacific Northwest, but I'm sure they'll continue to fruit for a while. So 
awesome to see. Keep your eyes peeled for these if you're out here in the Pacific Northwest. Always a beautiful sight. And moving just up the trail here, got a really cool little sight on display here. So underneath these ferns, growing off of this little branch or stick, we've got a nice little cluster of bonnets. These are likely in the Mycena genus. Delicate little mushrooms fruiting from dead wood. If I move underneath here, let's see what that gill structure looks like underneath. Nice. Beautiful to look at. I don't know exactly which species this is. The Mycena genus is, um, boy, it contains a ton of members and they're generally pretty small little mushrooms just like these, oftentimes growing off of uh, dead wood. Tough to kind of get down to species oftentimes, but always fun to admire and appreciate. Cool to see. I was out on a trail run with one of my best buddies just the other day, and we were kind of marveling at this, you know, just the simple pleasure of the spring green that hits out here. And, you know, we live in a place, we're really fortunate where it's green year round, but the greens that hit during the springtime are just totally different. You know, it always gets me excited for things to come and what's going on right this very moment. So kind of cool, but, Anyways, we were just kind of marveling at the spring sites and talking about our excitement to be harvesting stinging nettle once again. And he directed my attention to this plant as well, which is a really cool plant. So take a look at this. So it's kind of a compound leaf. You can see, you know, those of you who know plants pretty well could probably predict that this is in the carrot or parsley family. Um, if we take a close look, so one of the things that you'll notice about this is it's got these hairy stems, right? So there are quite a few toxic or poisonous plants that are in the same family. So, you know, I wouldn't encourage anyone to just rush out into the forest and look for this to harvest without really kind of doing your research and knowing exactly kind of what plant you're looking at. But in terms of distinguishing features on this, um, this sweet Sicily, very, very unique. If I had smell-o-vision, I would break off a leaf of this and have you take a whiff because the scent is just amazing. So it's got a really pleasant sweet anise kind of scent. And this is, you know, commonly used as a green that could be added to salads or different greens that you're serving up. But what most people are after with this plant is actually the roots. So, you know, some of the poisonous or toxic lookalikes that you need to differentiate. So say for instance, like a hemlock plant is not gonna have this furry root. But again, the key distinguishing fact, uh, feature, at least in my book, is actually the scent that this one has. So what you would do if you were harvesting this, you would dig up these roots. I hear of this even being used uh, as a candy, you know, like people will kind of dry this out, roll it in sugar and candy it. Others will add it to soups or stews or even dry it out and add it to teas. But really interesting spring plant out here. Again, this is Sweet Sicily and there are different species of this that grow in different parts of the country or different bioregions. But Really cool plant, so I just figured I'd stop and point that one out. It's not one that oftentimes catches my eye, but I was really pleased that my buddy, um, you know, brought my attention to that and kind of was reflecting on all the great experiences that he's had uh, using this as a culinary herb or root. So very cool stuff. So again, this is Sweet Sicily, cool plant to know. So it's April 12th, my buddy and I just rolled out 
to a recent burn in Western Washington. We haven't been out of the car for more than a couple minutes. And look what we're finding. Beautiful morale. And as we started to look around, signs of this everywhere. Should be a good day. So I'm just poking around for burn morels out here in what would be considered the needle burn. So this area, certainly the fire came through, but not as intensely as other places. I'm up on a log right now. Check out these giant shelf fungi over here. These guys are about twice the size of my head. And as I popped over this log, I noticed something fruiting up off of this down conifer. Check this out. So what we've got here is not what we're looking for. This is actually a false morel, Gyromitra genus. And if you look all the way down this log, it's entirely full of them, which is something that I don't oftentimes see. Usually I feel kind of excited if I just find a lone gyromitra out in the forest. They're always fun to look at. But to see this entire log just kind of full of mature gyromitra, it's quite a sight to behold. Let's go take a closer look. So sometimes people will reference, you know, venturing into the not recommended territory of actually consuming these gyromitra. So they'll reference doing several boilings of it to render the toxins of which there are many contained within this. But they argue that you can render those kind of ineffective uh, through several boiling and water changes. But Boy, that seems like dangerous territory to me. There's so many other great mushrooms out here. We're of course after the burn morels today and we're finding them. So no reason to kind of risk anything with these guys, but boy, I love stopping to admire them. So these actually contain a toxin that once you know, consumed and once inside your system is oftentimes compared to jet fuel, the same chemical components found in that. So it doesn't sound like something I want to be putting in my body and I would be willing to wager a bet that you feel the same way. But beautiful to look at. This is the false morel, gyromitra. So check this out. I've just kind of pulled one of these false morels here. I want to do something really simple here. We're just going to take the knife we're gonna give it a nice clean cut right down the middle. Let's see what this guy is looking like on the inside. So go ahead, take a look at this. So we can see we've got a hollow stem. Some could argue that that looks somewhat similar to Morel, but notice how as we track up, when we get to the cap, that looks quite a bit different from how our true Morels would look. So we can just see this globular mess on the outside. No pits or ridges, just kind of more like a brain type structure. And then inside we've got some hollow bits and pieces, but nothing like the true morels that we're after. And certainly they're not gonna give you the same culinary treat. And they're not gonna make you feel good, most likely either. So interesting to see. So we had a fantastic time out there in the burn today. And, you know, to be totally honest, I was really in the moment enjoying spending time with my buddy and just really getting the lay of the land to set ourselves up for success for this coming 
Burn Morell season. So I wasn't particularly great about getting footage, but I just wanted to take a quick second to update you with my key takeaways from being out there all day, and then also to provide you with the footage that I do have. So let me give you a quick rundown of you know what we learned out there and what you can potentially apply to your own endeavors here for this morel season. So to begin with, I want to point out that we were really heavily focused on low elevation burns because we're at the very, very front end of the burn morel season. So I'm sure several of you know that really to get the flush of morels that you want, it's heavily dependent on soil temperatures. So what we're really looking for is a 50 degree Fahrenheit soil temperature or, you know, that would be 10 degrees Celsius. That's really the optimal condition or that's the start of the optimal condition. And then the flip side of that is once we hit 60 degree soil temperatures, the morel season's over. It's not going to fruit the way you want it to. So it's really a particular thing that is optimized here in the early spring. And you really have to keep tabs on that and be on top of it. So for that reason though, we focused on an area that was low elevation. So all day we were under a thousand feet in elevation and primarily on south facing slopes because we've still had a lot of cold nights. So we want that sun exposure really warming up the ground. What we found was that, you know, we're still, even though we were in the perfect area, it's very much early days. We saw one other couple while we were out there and that was it. So um, very early days, and to be honest, if you're listening to this, it's mid-April right now, it's about to be prime time for burn morels. And the hope is, is that we can follow those up the slopes of the Cascades to higher and higher elevations as we get further into the season in the summer months. So that's kind of the big picture idea. Now, when all was said and done, we walked away having harvest 65 burn morels, all of which were reasonable enough size for us to rationalize bringing home to the table. Now that said, we left a ton of smaller morels because we knew, A, it didn't make sense to harvest those, especially not to not give them a chance to distribute their spores out there in the wilds. But also we knew that over the course of the next few days, those are going to continue to fruit and grow. And especially with the weather forecasts that we're looking at right now, oh boy, next few days are going to be fantastic. So, and really probably next couple of weeks, to be honest, at that same spot. So that's one thing. Another big takeaway, we were really keen on finding what associations we could kind of detect within the burn that we were working. So what we seemed to notice or realize was the majority of the clusters of burn morels that we were finding were seem to be associated with both cedars and lodgepole pines. Those seem to be the two trees that we were finding most of our morels around. So that's something that perhaps you can keep in mind as you're kind of poking around your own burn or kind of seeking out different spots or destinations. Keep that in mind and uh, something to really keep an eye out for is just those patterns that you see. Um, this is by no means a rule, you know, like we were throwing out theories all day. We were drawing associations too, of course, to those orange cup fungi that you may see in some of the footage. There were different ASCOs that were out there that were really, uh, there was one that was a smaller bright orange cup fungus that seemed to have a greater correlation with the morels than the other ascomycetes that we were observing. So anyways, all kinds of interesting little patterns, things to pick up on. It's going to be an awesome burn season. And, you know, up here in Washington this year, one thing that's kind of funny is that we didn't have serious burns uh, in 2023. They were all relatively small. So the bulk of the commercial pickers are, you know, basically flocking down to Oregon and California this year. So it means a lot of us recreational pickers um, can perhaps have uh, better luck out there in the field than we otherwise would. So something to look forward to. I'd encourage you all to venture out there, see what you see, see what you can find. And boy, until next time, happy trails. <laughs>